We've already read through the chapter of Joshua 1. I want to just read one verse to start off with and kind of get your, your mind rolling. But if, uh, if I give you a thought this morning or a title for the message, I don't really have one. The series of successful saints, conquering Christians, whatever you want to call it, how to get the victory. And you'll notice in verse number 8 of Joshua 1.8, uh, the first time the word success shows up is here. Joshua 1.8. It's the first and only mention of success here in Joshua 1.8. And it says this, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. So notice here in verse number 8 of Joshua, you have the first and only time this word success shows up in your Bible. And just to do a little, little, little nugget for you, I guess, if you want to call it that. I don't know if you all have looked into this before, but notice it's in chapter number 1, verse number 8. If you take those two numbers together and you think of just the idea of the number one in your Bible, it means unity. Number one in your Bible means unity, together, being together, being on the same page and things. And I'll say this, to have success in life, you've got to be able to have unity. You've got to be able to get along with people. You've got to be able to get along with God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You've got to be able to get along with people in the church, your spouse, your children, grandchildren. You've got to have unity. And it takes unity to have success. And then notice the number eight. The number eight in your Bible, it means something new. Something new. And I got to thinking about this. Success is new to a lot of people. A lot of people have not had success throughout their life. A lot of people don't want success. A lot of people can't handle success. And I even see about this. Success is a new. And the, the number eight is a, in your Bible. If you say that number out, oftentimes it refers to and pictures a new beginning. And su having success spiritually in your life is new to a lot of people. So much so. That believe it or not, but whenever people start having some actual success in their life and they're confident with their life with God and they're confident with their Christianity, they're confident in their prayer life, they're confident with the Lord, their sins even, they're confident confessing their sins and forsaking their sins, and they almost feel like they're not spiritual anymore. Because they've actually been programmed and winded and taught that for them to be spiritual, they're supposed to always feel like they're just a, a piece of dirt, a, a, a nothing, a big fat zero. You're a loser for Christ. You're not doing anything for the Lord. You haven't won enough souls. You haven't given enough to missions. You don't pray enough. You don't preach enough. You don't do this enough. You don't come to church enough. And, and then on top of that, everything that you do do well, you don't do it good enough. You can serve God for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, but when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you might as well just come down to an altar now and cry now because you're going to be crying later. And whenever you begin teaching people, I said this to a preacher the other day that I was like, yeah, I was like, I just believe personally that uh, you ought to be, when are you, you should be excited about seeing the Lord and being confident at the judgment seat of Christ. And he goes, what? And I had to explain myself. I was like, well, you know, and stuff I've been teaching you all for the last year, year and a half. And he goes, well, yeah, I guess. He goes, but don't you feel like you haven't done enough for him? And I was like, kind of. It's a paradox. The Christian life is a paradox. You're over here saying, Lord... I want to do more for you. I want to go further with you. I want to experience more of your joy. I want to get in that inner circle like Ron Ralph talked about. I want to draw closer to you. I want to learn more of your word. I want to grow and mature and do those things. And you want to do more. But there's also that paradox of the Christian life where you say, Lord, I'm content. I'm happy serving you. I'm happy living for you. And that's what the Christian life is. It's a paradox where you're striving for something, but you also have all things. You know how to be a base and how to abound. You, you, you're always trying to move forward. You're pressing forward to that mark, the prize, the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're also content, happy, and joyful. And there's a problem whenever you're not that content, joyful, happy, a, a spirit of rest inside of your heart and soul where you're saying, man, I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. You ought to have that confidence in your life. A lot of people's success is something new to them where they're not used to it. And then notice if you add those numbers together, one and eight, and you come up with a number nine, one plus eight is nine. Nine in your Bible often refers to fruit. Or bearing fruit. And having success in your life as a Christian is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit-filled life. I'm talking about having success financially, maritally, in your relationships, having success at your work, and sports, whatever it is, and having success ultimately spiritually. But having success in your life is a sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's what brings that confidence in your life that other people want and other people want to have. And wouldn't it help us to study out this book and to understand God's will? God's will for his people is to be successful. I'm not preaching a heresy or a prosperity gospel. He told Joshua, I want you to be successful. So what is this? Last week we covered leadership and victory and rest. What does this chapter contain for us? If we're going to go into the promised land, be victorious, have victory in our life, what, what does God tell Joshua to do? What does he tell the people to do? 
How do we get moving? How do we get that train to move? And, and whenever you and don't think of it like this, you might be living well right now with the Lord and you're on fire for God and you're growing and you're maturing. You're in that promise land. And I hope that you are. Keep in mind, whenever you start slowing down and you start get, going backwards and maybe you're like those tribes we talked about how you get your eyes over on the on the other side of Jordan. and You start wondering if you should go over there and start, you know, this, that, and the other. Remember this chapter about how they got moving how they got moving. Let me give you just some things out of this chapter of how to get moving forward, how to start with God, how to start going into the promised land, how to start being successful. It starts with number uh, one, it starts with a commission. It starts with a commission. Look down in verses one and two. Here's the commission. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So notice the commission is, now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan. He says, get up and go. He says, Joshua, get up and go. I have something for, I have a place I want you to be, a, a literal physical place I want you to come to. He said, there's a group of people I want you to go with. There are jobs and duties I want you to take care of. You have responsibilities over here in this land. Joshua, get up and go. So the first thing you got to do if you're going to get going is you got to move. You got to get up and go. And we have a great commission. We have a job. We have a responsibility. Jesus Christ said, go you therefore into all the world. And preach the gospel, uh, 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 baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Uh, Acts 1 8, uh, but after ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in all Samaria. You know, God brought the children of Israel out of bondage, Deuteronomy 6 23 tells us. He says, He brought us out that He might bring us into the land that He swore unto our fathers. That's over in Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe it is, verse 23. He brought us out thence that he might bring us in to the land that he swore unto his fathers. God brought them out of bondage to bring them into a place. And God brought you and I out of sin, out of hell, and out of bondage to bring us into another place. And Canaan's land is not just, it's a land of rest, but it's a land of responsibility. They have all kinds of jobs to do over here. All kinds of enemies to face over here. But the point being was that God freed them from this, this place. This place where they were going to go to eternal torment. They were in bondage to sin. They were in bondage to the world. He brought them out to bring them into something better. And whenever God brings you out of something bad, it's because he's wanting to bring you into something better. He's wanting to bring you into a better place. And you might be in a bad place in your life or have been in bad places in your life, whether it was growing up or just throughout your, your teenage years, your 20s, your 30s. You might have been in a bad place, but God wants to bring you out of that to bring you into another place. He brought us out so that he might bring us in. And notice he says, the land that he swear unto our fathers, uh, it was already settled. God already gave them this land. God already made the decision. God said, this land is yours. Here, it's, it's yours. You just have to go and get it. You know, God has given us so many promises that are ours. We just have to go and get it. So notice the Great Commission. Now, therefore, arise, go over this river Jordan. Notice also underneath the Great Commission, notice two times the word now shows up. Now, verse 1, word 1. And then notice in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead now. Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. I told you all last week, but live in the now. Too many people are living in then. Then. The then of the past and the then of the future. Too many people, they can't get up now. Do something for God now. Do right now. Have peace now. Have rest now. Don't wait until after services to be patient with other people. Be patient now. Don't live in the then of this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen on that? I hope you're all not living on the amen of this morning or the amen of yesterday. Come here. My yesterday, I was, I was doing this. I was going up Mount Sinai talking to the Lord. Things were good. I was on the phone with Brother Park saying, man, this happened and this happened. It was great. And then I looked out at my phone. I'm getting text message after text message. I just pulled into Brother Aaron McKnight's car or into his uh, house there. I was going to get the piano and I'm getting messages of this happening and this is happening with so-and-so. And I literally was driving home on the phone with people that were calling me and crying and stuff. And I was literally thinking, Lord, what happened? It was so good. It was so good. And, then, and I was like, well, we're going to get through tonight. I ended up spending time with Stephen and the family. And I, we had a good night. We had a good evening. I had things in my mind. I was like, Lord, I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm going to go on and serve you tomorrow. I got up this morning and, and then I was thinking, I was like, when I got here, I was like, Lord, I don't have my guitar. I was like, so now I forgot my guitar. And then little things happened, man, where things were behind and stuff. And what I'm trying to get you to see is this. I'm living in the now. I'm enjoying this moment preaching to you all. I'm not waiting until let tomorrow when the weekend comes or Sunday comes to be happy. No, I'm going to be happy now. I'm not going to live in the then of yesterday or the then of tomorrow. I want to live in the now right now. 
And if you're going to go forward with God, it starts now. What you've got to get that down in your mind. If you go home today and you see somebody, your neighbor, your friend, somebody across the street, man, it just makes you mad. They do something wrong. They send you a text message that makes you mad. Do this. Say, all right, look, that was then. This is now. I don't care if then was two minutes ago. Say, that's then, this is now. Decide now you're going to move forward with God. Say, God, I'm done with that. I want to move forward now. And then don't wait until the then of tomorrow to get something done for God. No, do it today. Do it today. So notice the commission is to go. Now, now therefore, arise and go. Notice in verses 2 through 5, you see the commission. You see the covenant in verses 2 through 5. Is this making sense to anybody? Anybody getting anything? Nobody. Okay. Verses 2 through 5. Notice the covenant. Verses 2 through 5. He says this. Uh, this is unto the land I do give, which I do give them, verse 2, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon you, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down the sun shall your, uh, be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. I like that. And I was, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Notice that here, I'm just going to show you four quickly. God gives them four promises. He makes four covenants with them. He gives them a promise of land. He says, unto the land that I do give them. God's already promised them a place, a geographical place. Now, I know that God deals spiritually primarily in the New Testament, but he also does deal ge geographically. And I'll remind you of this, church, there is a geographical place that God wants you and I to live and to work and to labor. There's a geographical church. I get that we're all part of the great the church of God. I get that there are other saints of God that are part of the, the, the spiritual body of Christ. But God has a local church for you to be a part of, a geographical one, a, a physical place to, to live. So he gives them a promise of the land that they're supposed to be in. And then he gives them a promise of power. He says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee. Ain't that good? He says, anybody that tries to stand up against you, he says, no man is going to be able to stand against you. He made them that promise of power. You know what cracks me up is people, they're fearful of man nowadays. They're scared of what a man says to him, what a woman says to a man. They, they, they think, well, this person's going to, they're not going to receive my track. I'm going to give them a track. They're not going to want to take it. And you're afraid of man. The Bible says, uh, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Psalms 118. Stop fearing man. Stop fearing the world. John 16, 33. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he gives them a promise of power, a promise of land. Thirdly, he gives them a promise of success, which we're talking about. He says, then thou shalt have good success. He says, you'll be successful. And that's not, that's not a heresy. That's not a, there's, a, there's a false gospel going out in this world right now. And a lot of the people that are on TV, the reason why they're on TV is because millions of people will watch them. Because the Bible says, in the last days they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In the last days they shall, he says, uh, 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 speak the things that become sound doctrine. He says, in the last days they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Meaning there will be preachers that are going to tell people what they want to hear. And there's a lot of men and, and women up on TV right now that are telling people everything that they want to hear, saying, God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be wise. And if you just, if you just love him enough, he'll, he'll heal you. He'll do this. He'll do that. And they speak good things to people. And they don't preach anything else in the Bible. They don't preach on hell like Jesus did. They don't preach on hell like the prophets did. They don't preach on sin like the Bible does. Paul mentions all kinds of sins throughout his, his Gospels. And what they do, that's a heresy of just teaching somebody that you can live any way you want to. As long as you come to church and you love God, then God's going to work everything out for you. No, that's not the case. There's a lot of sin you've got to deal with, a lot of negative sides to the Bible. So he's not saying that, but he is saying, if you follow my book, if you meditate this book of the law, he says, if you meditate in it, he says, then you'll have good success. You'll have good success. And notice he says good success. I never thought of this until right now. That tells me there's two different types of success. There's success and there's good success. That must, there's also a good courage that's getting ready to come up. That means there's courage and there's good courage. I know a lot of people that have courage, but they're fools. I mean, it's, it's courageous for you to say, you want to fight me? You know, you want to, you want to throw down? Okay, you're courageous, but you're a fool. If that's, if that's your attitude. There's people that they, they have a courage, but it's not a good godly courage. And there are people that are successful in this world, but it's not a good success. And God says, you want to be successful spiritually and in this world? He says, why don't you have some good success? And he, he makes them a promise to be prosperous and have success if they meditate in the book, in the law. I was just talking to Ephraim right before the service, and he said, I, he said I'm in love with the teaching around here. Uh, he, he basically, he said, I, I like, I'm learning more now than what I've learned in, in time past. And he said, and I believe the Lord wants me to keep learning more of his word. And, and I told him, I said, that's what we're all about. 
Because we believe that God really does hold this book above all else. We believe he holds this book above his very name. And I believe that whenever you give a man or a woman the ability to read and study this book, God's able to do things for them that no one else can. So he gives them a, a promise of power, a promise of success, a promise of land. Then he gives them a promise of his presence. For thy Lord, thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Point being, he says, I'll, I'll give you a promise of land. There's a place I want you to have. By the way, this Rock Baptist Church, we do have a building. I just don't know where it is yet. We do have a building. We just don't know where it is yet. God knows where it is. We don't. God had a land that they had no idea. They didn't know anything about it. He said, I've already had this thing. This was determined hundreds of years ago. He says, I've already got you a place you're going to live, you're going to abide. God already has a place for this Rock Baptist Church, a land, amen. We just, we're waiting to get it, amen. We're going after it. Land, power, success. He gives them a covenant, fourthly, of promise, or a presence. He said, I'm with thee whithersoever thou goest. And folks, God has given you and I a promise that he'll be with us wherever we go. Your family may forsake you. Your friends may forsake you. Your, the brother may forsake you. Your, your wife and your husband may forsake you at times. They may not want to have anything to do with you. Your children may forsake you. Your grandchildren may forsake you. The dogs and the cats may forsake you. Where you, you may go home and your dog doesn't even want to seem like he don't want anything to do with you. You ever been in that place where you just think everybody's against you and nobody wants to be with you? There will be times in your life where you feel that way, but you've got to remind yourself that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost is inside of you and he is with you. He's with you. So he gives them that promise in verses 2 through 5. So you notice the commission. You notice the covenant. And then you notice in verses 6 through 9 the conditions that he gives them for success. He gives them several conditions. I told you all this is the most verse by verse that we've done. But notice, I'm trying to give you a lot of material here. The conditions for success, notice it says, be strong and of good courage. In, uh, verse 6, 7, 9, and 18, it says, be strong and of good courage, meaning courage to do something for God. And I told you all that it says that there's good success and there's good courage, which implies that there's bad success and there's bad courage. But he's talking about courage to do something from God. So you've got to have courage to go do something for God. Uh, notice, secondly, turn not from it from the right hand or to the left, it says there in verse number seven. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. What the Lord's saying to Joshua is Joshua, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Joshua, if you're going to serve me and you're going to do right and you're going to take these people to another place and you're going to disciple these people and you're going to be a leader of these people, he says, you can't get distracted. You can't turn to the right hand and walk over there. Sorry for you all, it's right. You can't turn to the right hand and walk this way and you can't turn to the left hand and walk this way. You got to go straight right down the middle. You know, for Moses, whenever he climbed Mount Sinai, I'm just reading between the lines here. I'm assuming this. I'm assuming Moses didn't just go this way and just keep walking to the right to get up the mountain. And I'm assuming he didn't just walk around the base of the mountain to the left. You know what Moses had to do to get up the mountain? He had to go right up the middle. He had to climb up the mountain. If he was going to get closer to God, he had to go right down the middle. And what God is telling you and I is this. You can't go to the right hand and get caught off in a ditch on this side. And you can't go to the left hand and get caught off on a ditch on this side. If you want to imagine it this way, imagine the, the, this best way I, I, this way I like to understand it. The left side of things, you guys left over here, left side, think of liberalism. Don't get caught up in liberalism and worldliness and just think that you can live any way that you want to and have, have worldly music in your church and, and dress worldly and live worldly and speak worldly. Don't get caught up on the left side of things and don't get caught up on the right side of things, which is where you get so many standards and convictions in your life that you're weird. Amen. Remember, we don't want, we don't want weird Christians. We, you know, we want spiritual worshiping Christians. But don't get so many convictions and stuff where you're turning over here to the right hand saying, I am just so holy and so righteous that I'm going to be over here. He says, no, Joshua, you stay right in the middle. Don't get distracted. Don't let people distract you. Don't let things distract you. Notice thirdly, the conditions for success. He says, this book shall not depart out of thy mouth. Meaning talk about the book, memorize it, think on it, meditate in it, man, daily. He says, don't let this book depart out of your mouth. Uh, fourthly, notice a condition for success. He says, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Meditate on it. Ponder it throughout the day. He says, think about this book throughout the day. I think it's interesting. He tells Joshua, don't let this book. Oh, I'm getting bigger. Uh, I'm getting weaker. Uh, he says, don't let this book depart out of your mouth. Keep it in there. I know he's not talking about literally eating the book. But isn't it interesting that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. The Word of God is likened unto a sword in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's interesting. He says, look, you need to use this book because this book is the sword that will get into people's hearts and into their minds. 
That's why, that's why we preach the book. The book is what can reach into people's hearts and people's minds. And, in, and they, it can go to places that you and I can't go. You and I trying to reason with somebody and trying to use logic and signs and history. Those things are fine if you want to use that apologetics. You can do all those things. They're good to have on hand. But man, if you, if you don't do anything else, get the book in them. Just quote John 3.16 to them. Quote Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, man, Revelation you know, chapter 20. Quote the book to them and let that thing get in. Because that thing is the sword that goes in. It goes in here and it goes in here. And it just starts cutting up everything down until it reaches here. Amen. But he says, this book shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate there in day and night. And then notice he gives you the purpose of, of knowing the book and meditating on it. He says that thou mayest observe to do all according to all that is written therein. The purpose of knowing the book and talking about it is that you'll actually do what it says. You will actually do what it says. And I'll ask you this question. What's, what's better in life? What's a more value to God? Somebody that knows all of the Bible, all of the Bible, but only does a little bit of it. Or somebody that knows a little bit of the Bible, but seems to do almost all of it. And I've been trying to change the way that you think about this for, for over a year now. And I believe, I, believe it's work, I believe the Holy Spirit showing you and guiding you because he showed it to me. You ever thought of how strange it is that we get on the liberal crowd that has Christian rock, contemporary rock, things like that. And we say, man, they're, they're just so worldly. I can't believe it, this, that, and the other. And they know about this much of the Bible. They know Jesus died for their sins and there's heaven. That's about, that's about as much of the Bible they can quote to you. But yet, a lot of them have marriages where they're actually happy together. They have children that love them. They take care of their houses, their homes. They're good employees. They're polite. They're gentle. They're kind. They're loving. They're forgiving. They, they speak well to one another. They get along with their church. They like their church. They enjoy coming to church. They enjoy fellowship with other Christians. And I could go on. They enjoy prayer. They enjoy reading their Bible, even though it's a different version. They enjoy those things. But they only know about this much of it. But they have principles in their life where they're actually doing a lot of the Bible. And then you have another group where they know so much of the Bible, but they don't get along with people. They don't get along with their spouses. Their children don't like them. The, the people in their church don't like coming to their church. Which one do you think God's more impressed with? I'm just trying to get you to think, because what he's telling Joshua is this. I want you to know the book. I want you to think about the book, but I want you to do the book. And if you can only memorize five verses of the Bible, but you do all five of those, that's better than somebody that memorizes all the Bible, but they only do a little tiny bit of it. Point being, the whole point of the Bible was to do, but see, the, the key is this, the key is this. To have the Word of God, the King James Bible, and to know the book inside and out, and then to do the things that are written in the book, that's the key. And there are churches like that. There are Christians like that. There are churches all over America where, believe it or not, some of them are even non-denominational. Some of them are called just Bible Baptist Church, or Bible Church. Well, there's a Columbus Bible Church here up in Delaware, I believe. I've been watching some of their things online. They teach good doctrine. They teach dispensationalism. They're Columbus Bible Church. You never heard of them. I've never heard of them until recently. I won't go to one of their services on Sunday. Point being... But they, they get this book, man, and they live it. But you can have all that. You can have the King James Bible, but you, the main thing is that you live it out. I want to have all of them. I want to know the Word of God, but I want to experience the Word of God. So notice he says the purpose of the book is that you'll do it. I'm talking about the, the ways to get moving forward. You've got to keep the book in your mind, inside of your heart, man. Whenever you're struggling in life, go back to the book. Meditate on the Word of God. Spend extra time in prayer and meditation on the Word of God. Uh, you have your commission to move forward, to get up and go. You have promises. You have the covenants that he made to him. He gives him promises of land, power, success, and, and his presence. So we talk about the conditions of success. Notice, fourthly, the charge of Joshua. The charge of Joshua. In verses 10 through 15, you'll find the charge of Joshua. Notice in verse number 11, he says, pass through the host. Pass through the host. Essentially saying, Joshua, well, Joshua's telling them. He says, pass through the host, meaning go tell the other people, verse 11, that we're heading out. Tell them we're moving on. He says, go spread the message that God is doing something with us and we're leaving. You know, there are times in your life where you've got to tell people, hey, we're moving on. See ya. That's what he's saying. He's saying, go tell the people, say, we're getting up and we're moving. Because God has something better for us. And we're not wandering in the wilderness anymore. And I'm talking to people right now, not just in here, but there's people that I, I, I've been counseling, I've been helping with on different things. And point being, they haven't been enjoying the wilderness where they've been for years and years. But they don't have the heart to tell the folks, hey, we're heading out. We're leaving. 
And there are times in your life where you have to say, look, God has something better for me. I know I'm in God's will. And you have to go amongst the people and you have to say, look, I have to go now. I have to leave. And you also ought to do that in your personal witness, man. You ought to have a, a message as you're telling people saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm going further with the Lord. I'm going to walk closer with God. He's basically saying, go and tell the people in your life that you're moving on, that you're going forward. And if they want to come with you, great. But if they don't want to come, you're going anyways. He says, go pass through the host. This is the charge of Joshua. Pass through the host. Notice in verse 11, he says, prepare you victuals or victuals, victuals. Basically saying, make sure that you plan things out. Make sure you have enough food. Make sure you have enough water because we're going to go on a long journey. (laughs) You know, you better prepare in life and count the cost before you try and step out by faith. For some of you, whenever you, uh, you, you asked me about coming here to the church and different things like that, for some of you, you made the decision just like that. You said, yep, we're gone and God's going to make a way and God has made a way. Other people's taking longer for it to happen. But point being is that there's a cost to moving your family. There's a cost to leaving a church. There's a cost, man, to leaving your friends, leaving old, old acquaintances, things that you're familiar with. There's a cost in that. Yeah. And Joshua was telling us, people said, if you're going to come with us, you've got to prepare. You have to be ready for what's ahead. And that's what church is for. Church is for you to come, you get fed the word of God, you to fellowship with the saints of God, you to be encouraged, you to praise the Lord, man. So you can go out and face this wicked world and you can be prepared spiritually for the world. He says, prepare you victuals. And notice in verse number 11, he says, pass over this Jordan. Pass over this Jordan. If you're going to go into the promised land, you're going to be a successful saint, a conquering Christian and have victory in your life. You've got to make the decision to pass over. There has to be a decision in your life. Where you say, Lord, I'm going to pass over now. And life's full of big decisions. People act like there's, only, there's, you know, there's one big decision to serve the Lord. And there's one, the second big decision is uh, to, to totally sell out to the Lord. No, I believe your life is going to be full of Jordans. Your life is going to be full of River Jordans. You notice he said this Jordan. I know this ain't doctrinally right, but I'm going to preach it. it sounds like there's other Jordans. Let's we'll apply it spiritually. He says, cross over this Jordan, implying there may have been other little Jordans. But he says, no, you cross over this Jordan. This is the big Jordan in your life. And you have Jordans throughout your life, man, that Jordan of salvation, where you're saying on this side of River Jordan, you're lost, you're in your sins. And Jesus Christ is over there saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and in the end, the first and the last. He that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out all that my Father gave me. I, I, I will receive him and, and it, this, that, and the other. Man, Jesus is saying on that side, and you've got that River Jordan in front of you. And I thank, I thank God for the day that I went and got over that Jordan. And then one day God comes along and all of a sudden you run up and all of a sudden there's another river that's flowing. And you think, what in the world is this? And it's that Jordan of surrender. Where on the other side, Jesus Christ is still there. Joshua is still there trying to get you into the promised land. He's saying, do you want to come and serve me? Do you want to totally surrender your life to me? Do you want to be on my side? Do you want to, do you want to know what it's like to have the, 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 the fruit of the Holy Spirit inside? Do you want to know what it's like to have that abounding, spirit-filled Christian life? Cross over this Jordan. And man, I thank God for the day that I crossed over that Jordan. I thank God for the day where I said, Lord, it's, it's your will, it's not mine, whatever you want for my life. And then, but since then, there have been other Jordans that I've come to. And sometimes, you know what's on the other side of that river Jordan? Jesus says, look, there's going to be problems over here. There's enemies over here. Canaanites are over here. And I look over the river Jordan, and I see a bunch of enemies over there. I see a bunch of unknown land over there. And I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because over here I got problems. Over here I got issues. Over here I got things that I'm doing. I got beautiful land on this side. I'm over on the east side of River Jordan. I got beautiful things going on. And, and Jesus is saying, do you want to come over here with me? And I say, well, Lord, there's a lot of enemies over there with you. And he says, yeah, cross over this Jordan. And there's another Jordan in your life. And the point I'm trying to get you to see is this. There will be multiple Jordans in your life where God says, hey, cross over this Jordan. He's saying, make a decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As, as he says there at the very end, Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But pass over Jordan. So the charge of Joshua is pass through the host, go amongst the people, tell them you're heading out, prepare yourself, pass over the river Jordan. 11th, uh, on the 11th verse, it says, possess the land. Meaning this year is go and get it. Possess the land that God's already given you. People say, you know, the name it and claim it. They don't like that. I, I believe in name it and claim it, Christianity. I believe you ought to be able to read through this Bible and read promises that he's given you if it's doctrinally. Sometimes even if it's not, I believe God gets pleasure out of that. But man, a thing that's for you that says, my peace leave I with you, 
My peace I give freely unto you. My peace I live with you. Uh, over there in John chapter 15. Claim it. He gave you, the, he said, my peace I leave with you. Have you ever claimed that verse? He's getting ready to go and die. He's getting ready to go and be crucified. He's getting ready to be betrayed by Peter. And he already knows he's going to forgive Peter. He's getting ready to be beat, mocked, and spit upon. He's getting ready to have his beard plucked out. They're going to put a bag over his head and beat him and mock him and say, Who hit me? Prophesying to us. They're going to put a crown of thorns upon his head and beat it down. They're going to take a cat of nine tails and whip him. They're going to do all these things to him. He's going to be hung up on a cross. And right before he's going to go do all that, he says, My peace I give unto thee. That's power. That's the power of God. Having that peace, man, claim that promise. Think about it. Think about the promises of God that God has given you. And you know what he says? He says, go and get it. Go and get it. They're, they're yours already. The land's already yours. He says, pass over this Jordan. Go and possess the land that God's already given you. He's already promised it to you. You receive those promises by faith the same way that you received a salvation. And notice in verse 13, you have to ponder. This is the charge of Joshua. Pass over, prepare, pa uh, pa uh, pass through, possess the land. Then he says, ponder or remember the word. In verse number, uh, Joshua 1 verse 13, I believe it is down there. Uh, Joshua 1 verse 13, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you saying. He says, don't forget the word that the older man of God taught you. Don't forget that. I think that this, this covers what I was talking about earlier. You ought to thank God for the older men of God that taught you the Word of God. And you better never forget what they taught you. That's why it says train up a child in the way that he should go when he is old, he will not depart from it. That entails a lot of things, but what it entails is you teaching your children the Word of God also. And a pastor, a preacher te teaching people, he says, but, but train up a child in the way they should go. There are things inside of you, just so you all know, especially some of you that I know have been in church for a while, and the teachers and preachers you guys have had in your past, there are things inside of you that you're not able to get out of you. They're ingrained inside of you. God put them in there on that soil. Whenever that heart was fresh, that heart was open. And those things are inside of you, man. And you're not going to be able to get them out of you. There's a faith that was once delivered to the saints. There's something that's alive inside of you that's beating, that's thumping, that's saying, yep, yep, that's the truth. Amen. Glory to God. That's how you got to do things. And he's saying, don't forget the word that the old preacher preached to you. Don't forget what he said to you. Don't forget the command that he gave to you. And I know this. It is easy. Not just the man of God, but it is easy I know amongst our brethren, they don't like the term man of God, but whatever. It's a biblical phrase. That's why a lot of them don't have respect for preachers and pastors. And they don't have respect for the position and they belittle it and everything else. And I don't want to get me started on that thing, but I know it's been abused. But anyways, I know this. Not, don't just forget what, what Moses told you, but don't forget about what God told you. And it's easy, man, in our life. And I'm going to finish the last point here. It's easy in our life to forget what God has told us. And I assure you, some of you will leave here within two hours. You're going to forget everything God spoke to you about today. And you're going to forget about it. And you're going to need to come back next week. Amen. Or go back to the word of God. But you're going to have to remember. So ponder. That's Joshua's charge. Remember what you were told. And notice fifthly, notice lastly here, verses 16 through 18. I want you to notice the compliance of the people. I'll give you three things on this and we'll be done. We'll be done by 12. Five more minutes. Seven more minutes. Notice the compliance and the confidence of the people. Notice in verse 16, the desire to work. Notice verse 17, the dependence upon God. And notice verse 18, the dedication to Joshua, the, their dedication to Joshua. Notice verse 16, the desire to work, what it says there in verse 16. It says, They answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Notice their desire to work. He says, Whatever you tell us to do, we will do. You all ever heard the phrase, Many hands make light work? Many hands make light work, meaning the more the people that jump in and help, the easier the job is to get done. And I believe God's people, they are spirit-filled, they'll want to help, they'll want to work. And I wrote this down in my notes, I'd rather have some people never show up to the job than to show up and not help in any other way than they'll just give suggestions of how the job should get done. You all know anybody like that that shows up to a job site and they just want to give you suggestions on how to do it? They want to tell you how to, how to get the job done, how you should cut the wood or how you should do this or how you should do that. Or you're teaching, they want to tell you how you should teach. Or they're, you know, you're, you're trying to go win souls, they want to tell you how you should win souls. And I like what an old preacher said one time, or somebody said it. They go, I like the way I'm doing it better than the way you're not doing it. And there's some people, man, where they, their job in life, their role in life is just to show up and criticize all the, well, that's in the book of Nehemiah. They just criticize the job that's done, but not these people. They said, look, we're willing to work. So notice their desire to work. Their desire to work. They wanted to get the job done for God. Notice in verse 17, their dependence upon God. They knew that they needed God. Verse 17, according as we have hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God 
be with thee. Notice they, they had dependence upon God. They knew that they couldn't get the job done without God helping them. And you won't be able to get the job done without God helping you. You need the strength of the Holy Spirit, the strength of Jesus Christ. You need the Lord to get the job done. So notice you have the dependence upon God. In this church, this Rock Baptist church, we're depending upon God. Uh, Matthew there, the verse that for where our church name came from is upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This church is being built upon Jesus Christ. I'm trying to do the best way that I can to get, to get this church and not be built upon music, although I love music. I don't want to be built upon anything but a relationship with Jesus Christ. And all those other things, they just help cultivate that. But it's built upon Jesus Christ and upon His Word. So you see the dependence upon God, the desire to work, and lastly, notice under the compliance and the confidence of the, the people, they're, they're confident, they're compliant with Joshua. Notice their dedication to Joshua in verse 18. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and wilt not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be thou strong and have a good courage. These people, they loved Joshua. They loved him. They were confident with him. They believed, that, they believed wholeheartedly that Joshua was the man for the job. They were with him. They trust Joshua so much He's getting ready to tell them to do what we know happens in chapter 2 of a bunch of grown men march around the walls one time a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, we'll march around it seven times. And he says, and then on the seventh time, we're all going to take our bugles out. We're all going to blow our trumpets and shout. And the walls are going to come down. And they believe him, Brother Harold. They, <laughs> they believe it's going to They go, all right, Joshua, you, you said it's going to happen, so we, we just believe you. They believed him on that. They were, they were dedicated to him. They believe Joshua so much, not only does he tell them to do that with, with that, but he tells them to go and kill and burn Achan and his whole family. So he tells them, look, we're going to get the victory. We're going to do this crazy thing around Jericho. And they listen to him. Then he tells them, we're going to judge sin as a group, as a body, as, as a church, as a, as a local body. here. We're going to judge sin to the extent of we're going to kill a man and burn him and his family and his cattle and all of his goods. And they're with him on it. And we'll never have church discipline like that around here. But they're with him on it. They're dedicated to the man. They believe he's the man for the job. Uh, he, uh, they, they are okay with him going against unsurmountable odds. Uh, you see all the enemies up here uh, that are in the land of Canaan. Uh, you see the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Amorites. And I know Moses helped with all of them. Um, but you see there's going to be all 31 different kings Joshua's going to kill over here. One time he's going to fight five of them up here by the sea. Uh, we'll go through that sea eventually. He's going to fight them and there's five enemies that are surrounded, and they're going to fight all five of them at once. And you know what they say? They go, they're all looking around at Joshua, and Joshua's sitting there on his horse. And he's got his sword, and he's sitting there, I guess. And they're all sitting around, and there's the enemy, and it says like they're like the sand of the sea, the seashore. And they're all looking, and they say, Joshua, are we still going to do this? And Joshua goes, yep, we're going to do it. And they say, we're with you, Joshua. They were dedicated to him. They loved him so much and they follow him so much, they trust him so much, he's going to tell them, like I told you before in chapter 3, he's going to tell them to circumcise themselves. And I'm not going to go through that. But I don't know if I follow anybody to that extent. I don't know if I follow anybody that told me to do that. I know Paul told Timothy to do it, but I'd say, Brother Paul, listen, my ministry is not to the Jews, it's to the Gentiles. I'm not going to circumcise myself. But anyways, but they listen to him and they're dedicated and they're also, they follow him so much that whenever he divides up the land, which we'll go through later on in the chapters, Joshua divides up and says, look, this is your job. This is your role. This is your land. This is where you're going to be. This is where you're going to work. This is where you're going to labor. This is where your city is going to be. Whenever Joshua fulfills his administrative duties as a leader, they're okay with it. They're okay with it. Joshua loved them, led them, was a spirit-filled man. They were spirit-filled people. They were the group that God had for Joshua. And these groups come together, man, and they do so much for the Lord. They're dedicated to him. And one reason why leadership is so important to God is that as a leader, you can destroy the faith of other people and mess them up. And this goes for pastors, parents, and elders of the church. People are leery to trust authorities nowadays. I'm just letting you all know, people are leery now to trust authorities, and especially in the church. Because it has been abused. Pastors have horribly abused their role as a pastor. And they've hurt people. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have been hurt by pastors and preachers. Thousands and thousands of people have been hurt by deacons in the church that were doing things with money and sexual relationships. A lot of gossip that's been going on. People are hurt by those things. Yeah. And it gets them out of church. 
it makes them not trust leaders. It makes them not trust authority. It makes them want to have a home church. <laughs> it makes them want to get out of an IFB crowd or a fundamentalist crowd or a Bible believing crowd or whatever it is. It makes them want to get away from the, the people that are closest to the word of God. It makes them want to get away from it because they see hypocrisy in it. But I'm telling you this, God has Joshua still. He has Eleazar's that love the people, that, are, that love God, and that, that want to serve God and lead. And God's looking for a group of people that are willing to put away the thens of the past and live in the now and enjoy the people of God now. They trusted, they were dedicated to Joshua. They loved him, man. They were behind him. And Joshua loved them and wanted to help them and take them further with the Lord, man. And these people meet together. And they go into the promised land. And they have victory, they have rest, they have joy. They keep the word of God first and they go on with God. And that's what I want this Rock Baptist Church to do. To be made up of Eleazar's and, and those women, man, that asked for the promises of God. We're going to see that jo Joshua had some women behind him that were praying for him. Some women that said, hey, we got some promises that we want. They said, we got some land that we want. We don't have any husbands. We want some land that our fathers were promised, man. There were some women along with Joshua. He had a wife and, man, it goes on. But I want this Rock Baptist Church to be a place, man, where we're not over here. We're not over here wandering. We get people out of Egypt. We get people out of the wilderness, man. And we bring them over here to the land that flows with milk and honey. That's where I want to live. That's where I want to dwell. That's where I want to bring people to. And we get to be a part of that. You keep being faithful. You keep pushing. You keep moving forward. 